Hey, so right behind me is one of the second bridges at the beginning of the Trent Severn Canal. This 250 mile waterway is going to be an exciting opportunity for us to go and explore the whole canal and see how far we can make it. We're starting out here on day one. We're going to be heading north kind of from here essentially and going through as many locks as we can. We're excited to see what the Trent Severn has for us. So let's go and see what's up. Since I bought my Ranger Tug, it was always my goal to make it more than a day trip boat. I had traveled the Erie Canal, Narragansett Bay, and Boston Harbor, and now I set my sights northward to Canada. With a few months of planning and a couple of hiccups, the plan came to fruition in the fall of 2022. Accompanied by my trusty travel companion and chief engineer JP, I headed out to explore this exciting waterway. The Trent Severn Waterway is a 240-mile canal route connecting Lake Ontario at Trenton to Georgian Bay and Lake Huron at Port Severn. Its major natural waterways include the Trent River, Odenabe River, Quartha Lakes, Lake Simcoe, and Severn River. The scenic, meandering route has been called one of the finest interconnecting systems of navigation in the world and comprises an often included portion of America's Great Loop. Archaeological findings indicate First Nations groups utilized the waterways, lakes, and connecting rivers from at least 9000 BC. Knowing a good thing when they saw it, 17th century traders paddled this complex system themselves, hoping to make their fortunes in fur. Frequent traveler Samuel de Champlain explored the area extensively, seeking new turf in the name of New France. In fact, early entrepreneurs in a very young and yet unnamed Canada once considered Prince Edward County and the Upper Trent River an important hub for New World trade and commerce. Hey, so it's the end of day one here on the Trent Severn Canal. We started down in Trenton and we've come 25 miles and we're just south of lock number eight, which means we transited seven locks today and it took about five five and a half hours to get all the way up here this is pretty typical of what you'll see here at a lock here at trent severn uh, there's camping facilities bathrooms and obviously the lock is here and then if you look below me every lock that we have here has an opportunity for boaters to pull over there's restrooms and stuff so you can tie up for free of charge now a few of the locks have electricity but most of them don't but we're pretty self-sufficient so you can see Toto down there, and we actually have a neighbor across the street who's a American tug. Every stretch on the Trent Severn Waterway forms part of a historic navigation system that connects Lake Ontario to Georgian Bay. Parks Canada maintains and operates these National Historic Sites to make travel possible for boaters and paddlers along 386 kilometers of waterway. In addition to lockage and overnight mooring services, various other amenities at lock stations such as washrooms, campsites and potable water make it easy to plan a trip of any length. Each lock has its own story to tell and you will find friendly Parks Canada staff there to welcome you when you arrive. Stories are there to be made, and we are excited to head out and find out what ours would be. Go. Hey, so it's the second day of our adventure on the Trent Severn. And uh, today we started down at Percy's Reach, which was Lock 8, and uh, we've made it up through Lock 17. 
Uh, we stopped along the way in Campbellford for some provisions, and now we're headed up towards Rice Lake. Uh, the scenery has been phenomenal along the Trent Severn, and what makes it even better is the people that we've met along the way. The lock keepers, as soon as they meet you at Lock 1, they sort of know who you are and they expect you as you go up and you talk to them. They're super friendly, and uh, they were able to lock us on a complete day today, so we did uh, nine locks, I think. Um, we're headed up to Lock 18, uh, which is up by Hastings, and then tomorrow is going to be a fishing day uh, for Rice Lake, which is going to be a nice day, and then up to Peterborough and do a lift lock. So enjoy the rest of the scenery for this trip, for the next stretch. Most towns and resort areas along the Trent Severn have commercial marinas, and all locks have reasonably priced tie-up walls for overnight dockage. Many locks also have pleasant picnic areas. All have restrooms and some have showers. In addition to tolls, vessel must pay a mooring fee to tie up at overnight lock approach walls, plus a few other walls along the canal. Lockage, mooring, and camping permits can be purchased at all lock stations. And while boaters wishing to sleep on terra firma get priority, select locks also allow cyclists and hikers with valid permits to pitch a tent when space allows. Boaters can stay put for up to five days at the first 18 locks, starting at the Bay of Kint entry point and other locations impose one or two day limits. We chose to spend a few nights along the way camping. Hello, so day three of our adventure starts in Hastings here at lock number 18. We traveled up yesterday from lock number eight and made it up here just south of lock 18 in Hastings. Yesterday was a pretty heavy day with a lot of locks on it, but today we're fortunate because once we pass through this lock, which is only 9 feet, we're in Rice Lake, and that takes us 40 miles all the way until we get to lock 19, which is just below Peterborough. We're excited today because today is going to be an opportunity to do some fishing, although there is a little bit of traveling too, and then after that we'll stop at Peterborough for the night, and then tomorrow is the lift lock, so enjoy some pictures of us as we pass through Rice Lake. The canal was initially surveyed as a military land route, but the first lock was built in 1833 as a commercial venture. This connected a number of lakes and rivers near the center of the waterway, opening a large area to navigation by steamship. The government had begun construction of three additional locks when the Upper Canada Rebellion of 1837 broke out. This led to the government to re-examine the project, concluding that the route would have too many locks to allow for rapid movement for military purposes. They decided that the locks under construction would be completed, but the rest could be turned into timber slides. This left the completed inland section with no outlet, which business interests addressed by connecting to the route with a number of new toll roads, plank roads, and later railroads. Canada's government restarted construction in the 1880s, adding a number of new locks and pushing the route westward before construction once again halted. For many years after this, the canal was used as a political tool to garner votes from areas along the route, with little construction being carried out. It was not until just before the turn of the century that a number of political changes built up incredible pressure on the government, and serious work started once again. The canal reached Peterborough and Lake Simcoe in 1904, and the final sections were delayed by World War II with the link to Trenton opening in 1918, followed by the link to Georgian Bay in 1920. The first complete transit of the waterway was made in July of that year. Okay, we're towards the uh, end of day three here at uh, Trent Severn. We did Rice Lake today, and then we headed up the river and we're headed up to Peterborough. Uh, the lake was a little bit windy, so we didn't get as much chance to do the fishing we wanted to do today, so we kind of made a straight cut across. But uh, the trip up to Peterborough is really nice, as you can see behind me. Uh, we're hoping to end up there, and then tomorrow we're super excited because, as you're going to see, we're going to hit the Peterborough lift box. So we'll talk to you in the morning. The winding route of the Trent Severn flows under 60 bridges, passing through 44 locks, two of which are huge hydraulic lift locks built in the early 1900s. Located at Kirkfield and Peterborough, they were constructed to overcome the extraordinarily steep drop over a relatively short stretch of water. The lift locks of the Trent Severn waterway are truly Canadian marvels of engineering. The water bodies of the Trent Severn between Lake Ontario's Bay of Kint and Georgian Bay are at different elevations and the locks work like an elevator, transferring the watercraft between water bodies of various elevations. 
The Kirkfield lock has chambers 140 feet long with a width of 33 feet and a normal depth of 8 feet and a lift of 48 feet. The lock of Peterborough has the same general dimensions but its lift is 65 feet. The combined weight of the water and steel in a single lock chamber is 1,700 tons. Many of the locks along the Trent Severn waterway are at the heart of towns and villages with vibrant cultural scenes and delicious farm to table culinary experiences. The Trent Severn is more than just a waterway, with a great variety of trails and parks and scenic driving routes along its storied shores, travelers can enjoy the Trent Severn waterway by boat, by bike, on foot, or by car. Lakefield. <laughs> hey, good morning. It's day five of our adventure and we're in Lakefield today. We're at Lock 25. So this is about as far as we went north. Last night we went a little bit further and stayed at a marina and we did some fishing and then we came south now and we're headed back and we're going to head to Peterborough. So we're going to go through the lift lock twice, which is really cool. Tonight we're going to spend the time in Peterborough. There's a marina there. It's a chance to do some laundry, catch up, have something good to eat and then start heading south from there and do Rice Lake on Saturday. You'll see behind me, this is pretty typical of like what a lip, uh, lake, <laughs> sorry, lock looks like all the time. Uh, there are different uh, amenities at each one. Some have different restrooms and showers and stuff, but the lock staff here are excellent. Um, they'll lock you through really easily. And uh, for us, going down is gonna be a lot easier than going up just because of the currents inside the lock. But um, today, a little rainy, but should be some good fishing and we're excited to head south and we'll see you in Peterborough a little bit. The completion of the canal and lock system aided the development of central Ontario, allowing quick and efficient goods to flow to and from the major training centers along Lake Ontario. The rugged, rough terrain of this area of the province made travel by land extremely difficult and time-consuming. However, its legacy was short-lived. When the canal was finally completed, it failed to have a major impact on the economy of the regions it was built to serve. By the time it was completed, its design had been made obsolete by larger boats. It had been designed for boats too small to be commercially viable. In the years that it was under construction, railways had further developed their networks and improved service, which influenced settlement patterns. By the 1970s, its usefulness as a commercial waterway was over. Ships plying the Great Lakes had grown much larger than the canal could handle, and the railways that had connected the canal now took most of its freight. The waterway became obsolete for commercial purposes when the present-day Welland Canal was completed in 1932. The Welland could handle ships large enough to sail across the ocean, though cargo was generally transferred to or from larger ocean-going vessels at Montreal and transferred to rail. The introduction of motorboats found the Trent Severn perfectly positioned as a pleasure boating route, and today it's one of Ontario's major tourist attractions. 
Its passage through the cottage country, both Muskoga in the west and the Kawarthas in the east, drive thousands of visitors every year. Today it is officially recognized as a National Historic Site of Canada Linear Park, operated by Parks Canada. It's open for navigation from May until October, while its shorelands and bridges are open year-round. It is maintained and operated by National Park Service Park Canada and is now used for tourism by recreational boaters. There's a cruise line that operates the ship Kortha Voyager as well as a houseboat rental firm. Oh, Peterborough, it's uh, day six of the adventure here on the Trent Severn. We spent yesterday afternoon in the rain and uh, ended up in Peterborough at a marina there. Uh, we got to do some boat chores, some laundry, some showering, and uh, took a walking tour of Peterborough. We got some really good Indian food. I'm leaving with mixed feelings. I'm not quite sure what to think about Peterborough. Like on some parts, the downtown is trying, and uh, there's some good aspects to it. The marina wasn't the best marina, but uh, it, it met the criteria, and the downtown looks like they're really trying on working on it. So definitely is the largest city on the Trent Severn. Uh, you definitely get a feel of like some more urban when you stop in, but we're headed out now. We're going south, down one lock to uh, Rice Lake, and then we're going to try and do some fishing. So today is going to be a great day. The weather looks good, and we're looking forward to catching some big fish. The waterway is operated by Parks Canada during daytime hours from mid-May to mid-October and we were close to the end of the season which is my favorite time to travel. The controlling depth is approximately 5 feet and overhead clearance of the fixed bridges is 22 feet. Sailboats can have their masts stepped or unstepped at Belleville or Trenton at the southern end of the canal and at Midland on the northern end. A diligent skipper and crew can transit the Trent Severn's entire 240 mile length in six days because there's no Lock 33 and no need to pass through Lock 29 unless you take a long side trip. The route passes through 43 locks. We chose to take our time to pace ourselves and to experience the Trent at our own rate, which is the best way to do it. Six, we're actually on Rice Lake and unlike the first time we crossed Rice Lake, Today it is flat calm. The only wake that we're getting out here is from a poker run and you'll see like a number of speedboats out here. But uh, the boat traffic's pretty good. Um, we're gonna fish and hang out and swim today obviously for a little bit. And then we're headed that way and we're gonna end up in Hastings. So enjoy the scenery. No matter your transportation choice, whether it be boat, car, ranger tug, or motorboat, the Trent Severn Waterway offers lots to see and do for travelers of all stripes. Traditionalists without watercraft of their own can test their sea legs via boat rental, while road trippers should know locks generally feature extensive picnic areas, public washrooms, and space to park your car. Within easy reach of Highway 401, Lock 1 at Trenton is a great place to start. Carry on up to Lock 3 at Glen Miller and hike over to check the blee sailed boulder, an imposing erratic left over from ancient glacial activity. Afterwards, reward the kids with some time at the splash pad near Lock 6 in Frankfurt, and then continue to head north all the way throughout until you decide to stop. Unlike the Erie Canal, Trent Severn lock tenders do not monitor VHF radio. Before transiting the lock, we would either tie up to the blue line at the bottom of the lock to wait for the lock to open, or it would be open for us already since they knew we were coming. Since this was the off-season, often one lock crew would work several contiguous locks. Friendly lock tenders would tell us which side of the lock to tie up to. In most locks, water enters through small gates located at the bottom of the upstream lock gate. There is often turbulence near that gate. All such gate-type locks have numerous cables hanging down both sides of the lock covered with black plastic. When transiting, we picked a cable and looped a line around it. Turning our engines off, it provided a chance to meet the always friendly lock tenders who would use the canal telegraph to let other locks know of our progress, as well as provide us advice on fishing in the stretch ahead. At one of the locks, we had a chance to meet up with Canadian Armed Forces veteran Paul Nichols, who with his wife Terry owns Pennebrin Farm Equine Facility in Quesnel, BC. In 2014, they launched Communities for Veterans Foundation and spent almost a year planning the ride across Canada, where Paul rode his horse across the country. The ride raised awareness of the need for more veteran services in Canada. 
In spring 2016, they launched the Equine Assistance Mindfulness Program based at their farm. Veterans from across Canada immerse themselves in equine therapy for 13 days. It is a truly remarkable program helping those who served and run by a truly inspirational man. On the day we met him, he was with a fellow veteran actually paddling the canoe, the entire canal system on another adventure, and he was a truly inspirational person to meet. We locked through several stretches of the system with them and left in awe of their courage, perseverance, and humility as they worked to improve the lives of veterans. On day seven here of the Trent Severn adventure that we've had, we ended up back at Percy's Reach, which is where we spent our first night. Um, the takeaway from this adventure has been a couple things. I'm amazed, first of all, that such a piece of infrastructure that was designed to carry cargo and transport across Canada to the interior has now become such a great recreational opportunity. And the second thing is just the beauty and the people along the way that we've met. It's been incredible, the opportunities that we've met, the towns that we've met, the lock keepers and the people, and even the places that we've stayed. Um, this is an incredible journey that everyone should have an opportunity to take and see the beauty of this part of Ontario. We have one more day. We're headed down through our last seven locks, and then we're going to end back in Trenton to end our journey. We'll do a wrap-up then. Uh, but along here, we're just having some breakfast, and you can see behind me there's a gorgeous sunrise. So enjoy the last stretch. The canal we transited today almost wasn't. The realization of a dream of so many which had taken 140 years to accomplish was marred by irony. The reasons which had led to earlier generations to press for the waterway were no longer valid. The logging industry had gone into a decline and burgeoning railway systems now carried grain and goods to the major cities, making the once visionary Trent Severn waterway obsolete for commercial shipping. As the years passed, light traffic along the route necessitated only minimal upkeep and staffing at the many locks was drastically cut. In fact, at one time, the Canadian Department of Transportation considered closing the waterway down. In Parliament, politicians argued that instead of maintaining the Trent Severn for non-existing shipping, sections should be filled in and used as roads or railway right-of-ways. But time changed. A buoyant post-war economy in the late 1940s and early 1950s saw many people buying boats. The scenic Trent Severn now had a purpose, a route for recreational boaters and a major tourist attraction. This unique corridor of lakes and rivers, spectacularly carved by nature and linked by man-made canals is a favorite haunt for day trippers. Picnic facilities are located at every lock and easy access to the water draws fishermen at all hours of the day and night. Although no, never commercially viable, the Trent Severn has become an invaluable recreational resource. Winding among hills and farms, past quiet villages and a couple of energetic cities, as well as through island-studded lakes and placid rivers, this scenic and sheltered waterway lures thousands of cruising skippers every summer, and hopefully for a long period of time forward. Wow, what an incredible eight days that we just got to spend on the Trent Severn Waterway. We did a total of 222 miles, and honestly, we didn't even really touch like the upper part of the Trent Severn, which is even more pretty than the section we did. We met a ton of people along the way. We had a great experience. We got to experience some of the local culture and meet some of the great lock masters and other people that live in this great region. We're excited to continue this adventure next year, and we're going to try and do the second part of it. Uh, we hope you all uh, enjoyed following along with us, and enjoy the rest of the video. I'm so glad that I had a chance to travel to Trent and see this incredible waterway. As we wrapped up our final few hours on the canal, I thought about how this trip reflected my summer and my life. Building a canal is just a series of overcoming insurmountable obstacles that at first seem incapable of being mastered. What initially appears unachievable in the big picture can be achieved with small sections. There are ups and downs, gates open before you while things close behind us. We progress forward, northward, and remembering what we have passed over, anxious and hopeful for what is around the next bend. We remain in awe of the achievements we have completed.